at the end of the day, if you want to scale, you got to make some internal tool. So I would start there. What happens if you don't make internal tools? Here's your business case right here. You have to hire so many more people if you can't let customer service sales, customer success do their own jobs. Not everybody can learn SQL. Also think if the salespeople were learning SQL, they're not doing sales. How much time are they spending learning SQL and pulling queries instead of doing sales? These are the types of things that I would put out there. And actually, when you break this information down and show it to executives, they're usually like, whoa, I didn't realize that. I hired a salesperson and I'm paying them a lot of money and I would really like them to do their jobs. Hello, and welcome to an episode of Dear Melissa from the Product Thinking Podcast. The lines are now open and we're ready to answer your most pressing product questions. Which prioritization framework would you recommend and why? Hi, Melissa. Do you have any suggestions on developing a product strategy? Whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) That's a lot of questions. All right, let's dive in. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Dear Melissa. Today, we're going to kick off with three questions. We've got one about internal tools. We've got another one about moving from small teams to large teams instead of the opposite that we talk about a lot, you know, going from a larger enterprise into a smaller team. And then finally, too, we have a question on subject matter experts and product managers working well together. But before I dive into that, I want to remind you that you can submit your questions to me at dearmelissa.com. So if you have any questions for me or you felt like, hey, you know, I'm not really sure what to do about this or I just have a general question about my career, doesn't matter what it is go ahead, go to dearmelissa.com and submit that question. And we have this new feature where you can actually leave me a voicemail. So instead of reading your question, I can hear it straight from your mouth. But don't worry, it's always anonymous, so we'll never give you away on the podcast. So without further ado, let's dive into this week's Dear Melissa. Dear Melissa, in the past year, I've been a solo designer at a less than 20 person startup, and this gig also happened to be my first formal product position. I made the transition from almost five years in various customer-facing roles. Thanks to applying the advice you've shared, I was able to keep up with my far more experienced colleagues and consistently level up despite being a new product person. Here's my question. The company I'm joining in a few weeks has a dedicated design team that's nestled within a larger organization, about 50 people. It'll be my first time working in an organization this large, and I'm wondering what advice comes to mind. I've heard about the dangers of transitioning to a smaller team after being at a large organization, but I'm curious about movement in the other direction. Thanks in advance. So yeah, we've talked a lot about going from large organization down to small, but this is a great one. What happens when we go from small to large? Here's a couple of things that you can look for. Usually there's a lot more process about the way that this company does it. So when you move into a larger organization, they probably have... It might not be well documented, but they probably have some kind of process or some kind of ways of working that is common across the teams and across the organization. So expect to like get up to speed on that. You're not going to just walk in there and just kind of do what you've always been doing. You're going to need to learn when do we get together to review things? What types of cadences do you follow? Do you have a certain set of tools that I can readily pull from? Are there things that I have to use? Are there templates I have to use? Are there working relationships that I need to establish. Like, what do you guys do? That would be my first question when I get in there. Try to figure out how all the rest of the product people work, how the product designers work, see what they've been doing and what's considered best practice for the company. I'm not saying like best practice in general, but like best practice for the company, something that's defined, something that's rigid. And then also try to figure out what the bounds are there. Where do you have some freedom to do it your way? Where's the flexibility in that as well? So I would definitely look at those types of things. So expect like more structure, more processes. Now, sometimes that's great. And sometimes people like that. Sometimes people like the boundaries around those areas. The other part of working in a larger organization is you usually have more senior people, which is awesome. Now you get to learn from people. Now you usually have a boss or colleagues who've done this before. Hopefully they've been doing this for a long time. So you get to learn from them as well. So those are some really good upsides. The downside too that you could look out for is sometimes you might not want to work within those boundaries or those processes, and you might have some better ways of working that you did in the startup. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to keep that all to yourself. You could probably bring up like, hey, we've done this before. I think there's some improvement here. But I would say like, 
get up to speed on what they're doing, listen to what they're doing, understand it, see if there's any pitfalls before you start to try to make changes or be like, hey, the way that you're working doesn't really work. Like, I did it like this before, or I did this before, right? That's a bad way to start off in a new company, especially when people have been following the same path and the same processes for a while. So make sure you take the time to get up to speed, listen, observe before you offer suggestions, but usually there is a good place to offer suggestions once you do that. And it's not bad to bring in your own expertise and try to figure out how we can all improve together. So we talked about how the processes and the structures are probably more defined than you're used to. Pros and cons to that. If you're a person who felt like they were kind of winging it and needed a path, this is probably a great spot for you. If you were super experienced and only wanted to do it your way, maybe not the best way. Maybe it's going to be a little harder for you. Depends what the processes are. Depends if it jives with your perspective. But that's definitely something to look at. Startups versus large companies too. I've worked in both. I'll just say there's usually like different cultures, different ways of doing things. In a startup, you're typically moving incredibly fast. We always say the startup mantras are move fast and break things. I don't know if we should be breaking things, but that is what we talk about when we talk about startups. Large organizations tend to move a little bit slower. So you're going to have to have some patience with that. You're going to have to know that it's usually going to go through many different departments. When you get into a bigger company, usually we're getting like legal involved, compliance might be involved, other things might be involved. It might not be as easy to usher things out as it was in a startup where maybe you could put some together in a week and have like a whole feature launch to a team at the end of the week. That might not happen in larger companies. So speed is definitely a thing, but there's usually also more defined roles at larger companies too, which is nice. So in a startup, you sometimes play, you know, all the roles as a product manager. When I worked at a startup, I was digging into the database and trying to figure out what the data was because we didn't have a data system set up. We didn't have people who could pull the data. I was also sometimes designing, well, a lot of times I was designing all the interfaces because I was both a product manager and a designer. So I was doing it all. And when you get bigger, all the roles usually get a little bit more specified. So you're probably not going to be doing it all. And you have to ask yourself, which are the pieces that I really enjoy doing? And what's the pieces I don't enjoy doing? Because if you find like, hey, I really like that piece, or that's where I was thriving, and it's now somebody else's job, that's a good inkling that maybe that's more of your role rather than the one that you're in. But If you are like, nope, I really wanted to focus on this role. I joined a larger organization, so I didn't have to do all the other stuff that I was kind of doing off the side of my desk. Large organization could be a great place for you. So those are things I would think about, like define templates, processes, and structures, usually in larger organizations. And again, not all large organizations have this, but (laughs) you will typically find more of it than you would find in a startup. So they're going to have a way they do roadmaps. They're going to have a way They'll probably have their own set of programs of whether they use Figma or something else to do the design. You might not be choosing your own. They probably have a lot more people there. So hopefully you'll get some experienced mentors, which would be awesome. And there's probably a little bit more overhead and politics, though, going on too. probably more departments involved, more stakeholders, all of that stuff to look at as well. So when I talk about dangers, you said I've heard about the dangers of transitioning to a smaller team. But what about the other direction? There's pros and cons for everything. And I would say at the end of the day, when you look at, do I want to be in a large company or a small company? It's up to you. Do you thrive in uncertainty? If you thrive in uncertainty, startup world is great. If you don't thrive in uncertainty, you don't love figuring it out on your own, larger organizations are fantastic for you. Now, you could also be a hybrid, and I will say this ebbs and flows. I feel like with how experienced you are and how much you know what you're doing, When you get really experienced, it's easier to thrive in uncertainty because you already have your own toolkit and your own framework for doing things. So you can walk into a place that's a mess and be like, this is how we do it and apply all that structure that, you know, everybody else needs to thrive and you need to thrive. When you are less experienced, it's usually better to join a bigger team rather than a team with no structure, no processes or no people to learn from so that you can build up that toolkit. So that's also something to look at. It ebbs and flows in your career. What you want now might not be what you want in five to 10 years. And that's totally fine. So that's what I would think about. What do I thrive in? What can I learn? What can I take with me on this journey about moving into a larger team? Did you know I have a course for product managers that you could take? 
It's called Product Institute. Over the past seven years, I've been working with individuals, teams, and companies to upscale their product shops through my fully online school. We have an ever-growing list of courses to help you work through your current product dilemma. Visit productinstitute.com and learn to think like a great product manager. Use code THINKING to save $200 at checkout on our premier course, Product Management Foundations. All right, next question. Dear Melissa, I've recently joined a digital health company as a VP of product. Our product trios or quartets are comprised of a PM, a product designer, a tech lead, and a psychologist. The psychologists are key members of the squad. They bring a deep domain expertise to translate traditional therapies in a digital format. Some of them are also behavioral change scientists, which is also an extremely valuable expertise to positively influence or nudge the choices that users of our products make. However, when it comes to behavioral change, it's not clear how product managers, product designers, and psychologists can collaborate together. Product managers know how to work with product designers, but they don't know how to also work with a behavioral change scientist who has a lot to say regarding product design. There's a lot of overlapping between roles. There are disagreements regarding processes. It's not clear who can decide what. And overall, it leads to frustration and frictions. How can I help the team to make the most of everyone's expertise and work better together? Well, the first thing that crossed my mind when I read this is Matt Waller is probably extremely excited about this if he's listening to this podcast. And if you don't know who Matt is, you should definitely go check him out. He wrote a book on behavior design and product. So I feel like it's a great place for you to go look. But Matt Waller is one of the best behavior design thinkers when it comes to product management. Now, I think there's a couple of things to dig into with your question. Are the psychologists basically being subject matter expertise? Because you said they bring a deep domain expertise to translate traditional therapies into a digital format. Fantastic. Okay. So if they're a subject matter expert, what they should really be providing is the context and the content pieces to the product managers and the designers so that they can decide what's the best solution to turn that into. I've worked with a lot of healthcare companies where we've done this in the past. We've had subject matter expertise who were like nurses and doctors, and they understood all the content that needed to happen and the processes that the doctors went through in order to care for their patients. So basically... The doctor would be like, yep, I see a patient that come into my office. Here's the things that need to get done. These are the types of things I need to like submit into insurance or fill out on their charts, blah, 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 blah. Product managers were like, great, cool. I'm understanding your process. I'm writing down what the requirements are. I'm trying to figure that out. And then they're working with the designers to figure out how do we make this flow better. And the doctors and the subject matter experts are over giving them feedback on that oh yeah, this is easy to use, or this is great, or I really like these competitors out there. We should be learning from them, those types of things. But the final say on what we move forward with comes down to the product manager. The product manager decides like, these are the features. This is the product that we're going after. Here's the business value. Does it meet those goals? And the actual firm design of the product comes from the UX designers. Now, if the designers and the product managers are great, They should be listening to all the feedback from the psychologists or the doctors or nurses if you're in another company, whatever. But at the end of the day, it's the product managers and the designers that have final say over the solution. Psychologists should be giving input on there. They should be using them as subject matter experts. And I think the behavioral change is incredibly important there because they can get that psychology behind it. But you can't override the team that knows how to build software in their area. So ideally, we're all collaborating together. But what it sounds like is your psychologist might be trying to design the product for everybody. And my question is, are they designers? You can get feedback. I think feedback is really important. But are they designers at the end of the day? And behavioral change scientists, I think, make great product managers. So if there's an opportunity as well for one of those people to become a product manager, like by all means, train them and and let them do that. You know, if they have the aptitude for it and they can learn the skill set, I think that's great. But if they don't have that skill set, then you got to defer back to the product managers to be able to do that. So you need to think of this as a subject matter expert giving input and advice to the team and letting them understand the context in which the psychologists and the patients live and utilize these tools and therapies and all that stuff. But then you also have to trust the product managers and the designers to do their job. 
which is to create the product. Now, one thing here too sounds like you don't have that set. It sounds like they're vying for control and there's probably a lack of trust around this team. You could see there's clear delineation between product managers, designers, and developers because everybody's got very clear roles there on who owns what, who has the final say on what pieces. You need to set those roles too for the psychologist. Is the content correct? Is this therapy being delivered in a compliant way? Is the therapy being delivered in an effective way where it actually will help the patient? Feedback from that nature will help the product managers and designers. But if they're giving feedback like, hey, that button needs to go over there and it needs to be orange, that's not their job. That's a designer's job at the end of the day. And that's where I think you need to clear up that tension. And that's what I would make incredibly crystal clear to everybody is these are where our roles are and this is where we overlap, but this is where one person has final say, here's where the other role has final say, and here's where this other role has final say. And remember at the end of the day, like psychologists in your case are the subject matter experts. They're not the product managers unless you take one of them and make them a product manager, but it has to be a defined role. And I'm not saying that's the only path. I think these two roles can work together, having a subject matter expert and a product manager work very closely together, but you have to have definitions of who gets final say over what. All right, last question. Dear Melissa, I work for a SaaS company where we are very good about building products for our customers, but we lack a development team to build product for our internal customers. For instance, sales, customer service, customer success, and our database team rely on SQL queries to determine product usage. I would like to approach leadership about starting an internal product team. Do you have any suggestions for ways to frame the request? Thanks. Ooh, this is a great one. I was actually the internal product team for OpenSky and I worked on internal products a lot. So here's the thing. Every company needs an internal product at the end of the day. When you are small, it's totally fine to like dig into the back end and not make like a huge interface for everybody to do their jobs because you're scrappy and you're starting it together. You're throwing things together. But At the end of the day, if you want to scale, you got to make some internal tool. So I would start there. What happens if you don't make internal tools? Here's your business case right here. You have to hire so many more people if you can't let customer service sales, customer success do their own jobs. Not everybody can learn SQL. Also think if the salespeople were learning SQL, they're not doing sales. How much time are they spending learning SQL and pulling queries instead of doing sales? These are the types of things that I would put out there. And actually, when you break this information down and show it to executives, they're usually like, whoa, I didn't realize that. I hired a salesperson and I'm paying them a lot of money and I would really like them to do their jobs. There are things out there to have product usage. And a lot of companies hate implementing some product usage tools like Pendo or Amplitude or anything like that because it takes some time to actually get it up and running. But what you need to do is calculate out and lay the business case for, hey, if we do this now, and we spend the time doing it now, this is how much money we'll save over the next year or two, and we won't have to hire more people, and this is how much more time sales can spend on sales, and this is how much more time customer service can spend on customer service. Like That business case is very important to get out there and in front of executives. Also, you will not stay this small forever. Hopefully, you're growing, and that's what your executives want you to do. They want you to grow. They want you to get all the sales. They want you to go crazy. So, hey, if you want to go from making $5 million in ARR to $20 million in ARR, how many more people do we need? Well, at the rate that we're doing this, (laughs) how much time would those people be spending learning SQL? How are we going to tell somebody that we need to hire that they have to learn SQL or that they learn how to code or they have to do all this other stuff? At a certain point, you're not going to get great people to come work for the company either because they don't want to do that. It's just going to be time consuming for them to learn all these new things that are not really important to their job. And I'm not saying product usage isn't important to their job. I'm saying they shouldn't have to learn SQL. There are tools out there that do this for you. So those are the cases that I would really make. I worked at a startup and I had the same problem. Like we couldn't get the data out of the systems. I learned MongoDB because that's what our database was in. So I literally took all the MongoDB classes when they came out. I got certified in MongoDB just so I could pull my own product usage. Do you know how time-consuming that was? I was spending, I don't know, I spent months learning MongoDB. And of course, like I could be a little bit effective immediately and I needed to learn it because they just wouldn't prioritize putting the product metrics in there. But you know what? 
I've never used it again. (laughs) I've never used it again with my career. And for the like, I want to say probably 120 hours or more that I spent learning MongoDB. And then let's not even add in all the time that I spent pulling all the stuff out of MongoDB because it comes out in a really weird format. And then I had to sift through all those metrics and everything. Like I could have been doing much more valuable work. I wasn't hired to pull queries out of a database. So this is what we need to look at. What are we hiring people for? And do we want to hire other people to like do that type of work? Or do we want to just take a couple sprints and put in some internal tools and some product metrics and all those things? Because you will not be able to scale one day when you get too big and then it's going to be too late. And then you're going to have a lot of important things to be doing. You're going to have no time to implement this stuff. And you're going to be flying blind because nobody's going to have the data that they need to make decisions. Because one day people are going to start, like, just stop pulling the data. I guarantee you, you're going to get tons of requests in from customers. You're going to get tons of requests in from other people inside the company. And one day, all those people are going to go, I think maybe we'll just try to figure out how to prioritize these things on our own. And I'm not going to bother to write the SQL queries. I've seen this happen a lot. People will get tired of doing it and then they'll just start guessing. And you don't want that for your company. So I would make that case. That's what I would really look at. And if you want to play this back for the people who are making the decision, I hope it helps them realize that you need these things to scale. And you might not be scaled right now, but I really hope one day you do start to scale and it's going to break if you don't do this now and you don't want that to happen. You want to do it now while you're still growing. You don't want to throw a wrench into the machine when it's really big. So now's a great time to start looking at all the internal tools and what we need to do to streamline our company so that we can grow and we can make more revenue, but we keep our costs low. That's what we're trying to do here as businesses. It's all about margins. Your margins will thank you. Your investors will thank you if you just take a little bit of time out now and get started with these things, and then you can scale them and grow them as you grow as well. So that's it for Dear Melissa this week. Again, if you have any questions for me, please go to dearmelissa.com and drop them to me. Otherwise, we'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of the Product Thinking Podcast. And if you really enjoyed this podcast, I'd love it if you let us know. Please subscribe wherever you're listening to this. And if you could go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review, we would really, really appreciate it. Love to hear what you're thinking about. Also, drop me some suggestions on Twitter about what you would like to learn or hear next on the podcast. My Twitter handle is at Lissy Jean. L-I-S-S-I-J-E-A-N. And I look forward to talking to you all next week.